Well, collectors, uh, here we are again. It's uh, February 15th. It's um, President's Day today, and um, yesterday was Valentine's Day. So I hope that you all managed to get some uh, flowers and maybe some chocolate too for that honey. It um, helps a lot with the marriage, you know, when, when uh, uh, you show that you care. It's a big thing. But anyhow, this time uh, we're going to um, we're going to talk about army officer swords and also uh, police and SS Dagon. Uh, it's a pretty vast subject, and I've tried to just keep it to the point where hopefully you can grasp a lot of the things. But uh, there were literally hundreds and hundreds of patterns of swords. Um, every army officer uh, was required to buy a sword. So almost all of the Soligan factories um, offered a, uh, a sword model uh, or maybe five or six or maybe ten or twelve or even more than that. Uh, some were very elaborate, some were very simple. Uh, and the choice of what the officer wanted to buy was up to really what he could afford. Um, and with army swords, if you look at the prices in the catalogs, you usually see that uh, the cheaper the sword, the more of that sword that you have to run into. Uh, because it was tough times then. And of course these were just young men without a lot of money. Uh, but we do see our share of uh, of extra cost swords too. But what I'm going to do is try to start with um, uh, the prime company for swords was Carl Eichhorn. And swords, uh, you'll find the hilts are made of either brass, which was then fire gilded, uh, or aluminum, which was also fire gilded. Uh, the real early swords are normally always brass, but we do see aluminum coming in around 1937 or so. And let's face it, if you were going to carry this sword every day, um, it was a lot easier if it was aluminum. So we see our, our share of those. Um, but with Eichhorn swords, normally uh, the blades will measure somewhere between 28 inches and usually 35 inches is the longest one you'll see, although I have seen some whoppers over the years, but normally 35 inches, and that would be uh, for a man that was uh, six foot or over. So we don't see a lot of the 35 inch swords, but we see our share. Uh, the sword blades were, um, uh, they were uh, made of, um, uh, a highly high quality nickel plated finish and for the most part sword blades are still in good shape because the um, finish was so uh, uh, greatly done uh, and for the most part um, veterans once the swords were brought back they kept them in their scabbards so that preserved the blades quite a bit Although we see scabbards with uh, sometimes quite a bit of, uh, of damage because let's face it, they were pretty klutzy things when you were carrying them around. And also anybody that collects swords, uh, you all know you lean them up against the wall and the next thing you know you bump into them and crash, they come down. And uh, Also a lot were in cellars over the years. and. Since you had water problems, a lot of times the lower chapes were getting rusted and all that. Um, so to have a great scabbard is, is a really, really nice thing. But it's not tremendously important because the main part is the hilt and the blade. Uh, so, I mean, you don't want a scabbard all full of dents and dings. And the paint is horrible. Obviously, if you can find a nice scabbard, uh, that's a plus to the sword, and it also adds value. And one of the things about collecting swords, uh, it's never enjoyed the um, popularity uh, of the dagger and bayonet era of our field. And you ask yourself, well, you know, I wonder why that is. 
Well, if you think about it, uh, swords, you need a, a lot of wall space uh, to be able to display them. And many of us may be, you know, you just get started when you're married, you're in a small apartment, and uh, uh, who's got room for swords on the wall? Uh, and of course, your wife, <laughs> usually, uh, she wants a picture or some roses or something, uh, not, a, not a sword, you know how it is. But so swords, maybe two reasons why they're a little bit slow in collecting, because of their length and difficulty to display. And the second reason is to, and I'm sure a lot of you guys can identify with this, they're a lot harder to hide from your wife. You know what I mean? You can slip that dagger under a pillow or in a drawer or somewhere, but that sword is, uh, something's going to stick out. So it's a, it's a little harder to, uh, to do that. Uh, and once you get six or seven or a dozen of them, they really start to take up a lot of room. So you have to have a, uh, a wife that's very, very understanding, which some of us do, but uh, most of us don't. But anyhow, so Eichhorn was the prime producer of swords. They made the most. I think they had the most models that they offered too. And they were very smart because when they, when um, Hitler came to power, they realized that the uh, designs of the swords that they had make in, made previously in the imperial time and the Weimar time, the hilt designs were going to change to reflect uh, the new insignia uh, of the Third Reich. Uh, so this meant big business for the uh, uh, Soligan industry, of course. But what Icorn did, they thought about it and they thought, well, maybe we could offer a line of swords and have a pattern for them, a series for them. So they came up with the idea that um, why don't we take the old respected historical generals and field marshals from the past and name the swords after them. So they came up with nine specific patterns that we today call the field marshal series and each sword, um, except for a few uh, which weren't included in the series, were named after uh, historic field marshals. So we'll start with Icorn Swords, and um, I'll just, uh, that's what I needed, that's good. Okay, so uh, Icorn's Patterns of Swords with the Field Marshal series, uh, they also offered a basic design for NCOs, which was the same as they were offering during the Weimar period too, and uh, we call it a dove head sword uh, because it just it has no decoration on it it's it's uh, smooth surfaces throughout and it was nickel plated they also made a version that looks like this that was um, brass and gilded for the fire officials uh, but this is the basic NCO type sword celluloid over wood grip and this one is wrapped with triple aluminum wire um, these swords are not expensive. You can usually buy one for $250, $300, um, except for once in a while you'll find an NCO that perhaps had a little more money than someone else, and here you'll get uh, etched blades. Uh, this man paid more money to have his blade etched, and it makes for a very nice piece. He was probably a high uh, ranking NCO. So from, from that design uh, we start with the, uh, with the field marshal uh, series. Um, prior to the introduction of the field marshal series, Icorn produced a sword uh, that's a simple dove head uh, having nice oak leaf raised designs on the uh, back strap and also on the um, uh, D-guard, again with the celluloid over wood grip. 
this one is triple wire wrapped with brass wire, but you'll notice it has just some oak leaves on the langette. So this was introduced just prior to the Third Reich, and some of these swords were sold during the uh, Third Reich time. Uh, they have beautiful nickel-plated blades, can't beat it, just, just really, really great. And then with the introduction of the Field Marshal series, uh, the first official uh, Field Marshal pattern was called the Rune. R-O-O-N, named after Field Marshal Rune, and it has a simple engraving uh, of a Wehrmacht eagle uh, on the languette, but if you compare it with the early uh, leaf type, it's the same, same sword. So this was not a difficult um, uh, adjustment to make. Um, and what's kind of nice about the, um, the rune patterns, um, the, um, the oak leaves, for instance, and acorns that are on the back straps of all the swords with the grip tabs, uh, they're engraved oak leaves on this particular pattern. They're, they were stamped out rather than molded in. So that's the first type. Another pattern that was not included in the Field Marshal series because uh, it was a sword that was kind of an earlier design was called the Model 1695. It has the um, Art Deco uh, beautiful open-winged eagle um, artistry that was created by Paul Casper uh, with a beautiful um, panther head. Uh, one thing we, we always talk about, lion heads and panther heads, and you know, you wonder, well, what the heck is the difference between a lion head and a panther head? Um, I guess the only real difference is that a lion head has a bigger mane on it than a, than a panther head. Uh, you just kind of got, got to get used to looking at them. Uh, but this is a, this 1695 model was a beautiful sword with raised, oak leaves and acorns. Uh, this particular one has the original officer's port on it. Uh, port today are very, very much in demand and very hard to find. Um, if you have a sword with a port that's a great thing. Uh, and it's very difficult to find an original one that, uh, if your sword is lacking. So it's a hard job. You have to search the internet and all the dealers. So, after the 1695 pattern, we have another field marshal sword that's called the Wrangle, W-R-A-N-G-E-L, not G-L-E, G-E-L. Uh, the Wrangle pattern is actually a very similar design to the 1695, because you can see that the um, Kasperg Art Deco Eagle on the cross guard uh, is the same as the Eagle on the 1695 model. So what Eichhorn did here, if you study the swords, this piece here, this back strap with the dove head and this back strap with the panther head uh, are different fittings, obviously, but the cross guard and the D guard, you can see, are both the same. So they used the same parts to make these two swords, just requiring the back strap and, and um, pommel of the sword. So this saved money for the company. So, and you'll see this on, on other patterns too. Uh, the next pattern that they, they produced, which was quite popular, is called the Blucher. Uh, this is a silver sword uh, that was um, uh, purchased by an SS man, uh, but it is in the Blucher pattern, and you'll notice that the Cross Guard Eagle, again, is the same uh, Kasperg Eagle, so all they had to do was change the back strap 
and the lion head, which was one fitting. The pea guard is the same. And we'll talk about this particular sword a little later on in the lecture, but that's what the blucher looks like. Now you can see that I was saying, what's the difference between a lion head and a panther head? I think you can see that those are different cats. See the big mane on the, on the silver lion head? I might also add that uh, swords with panther heads or lion heads uh, were fitted with faceted red glass eyes. And sometimes we see uh, swords that come back from veterans where the veteran thought, ah, these are real rubies and they're they dig them out and take them to the jeweler or whatever, but they weren't. They were just they were just glass. And uh, fortunately, there are replacement eyes available. So if you have a sword like that, it it um, it can be repaired, assuming that the tongs that held the eye in are still there. So then, moving along, the next pattern was the Field Marshal Durflinger, and the Durflinger sword. Uh, has a lot of nice attributes to it. Uh, you'll notice it has a flat uh, pea guard, uh, which is different than the other types. If you compare an ordinary type, see how the pea guard is flat on the Durflinger? So it makes for a more interesting look. Uh, the Durflinger is a dove head type. Um, it has the usual um, uh, oak leaf type decoration. All these are a little different on the back. Uh, oak leaves, or no, similar to what the uh, the back motif is, is on the uh, pea guard. And then they featured a Wehrmacht uh, style traditional eagle uh, on the langette. I might add too that a lot of these field marshal swords, when you look on the bottom of them, uh, I don't know whether I can see it here or not, but we'll look at another one. Uh, but a lot of them will be marked Gesh Gesh or DRP. Uh, Gesh Gesh meaning they had applied for a patent on the design, or DRP meaning they already had received the patent on the design. So often you'll see that stamped on the bottom of um, Icorn Field Marshal swords. So from the Durflinger, we move to the Zeiten pattern. And you'll notice that the Zeiten pattern is the same as the Durflinger, except for the panther head and the back strap. You'll see that the cross guard, uh, quillen end, and flat P guard are the same. So again, Icorn saved some money here because they could use a lot of the, uh, a lot of the same parts. Uh, to make the Zeiten. I think the Zeiten is a particularly attractive sword, don't you? I mean, boy, it's really got, it's really got the look. And I'll show you, I think the Zeiten, yeah, I think if the camera can see it, see that DRP there stamped on the bottom? Again, that means that Icorn had a patent on that design so that Holler couldn't produce their sword, or Clement and Young, or whatever. They had the exclusive rights to it. So, that's the Zeiten pattern. And then from there, we move to the Freiherr von Stein. Everybody says Freiherr von Stein, V-O-N, uh, but it's not. It's Vom, V-O-M. Uh, doesn't matter much, I guess, but just to correct it, because I never see anybody spell the name properly on it. Uh, but the, um, the von Stein pattern uh, has the traditional Wehrmacht eagle raised out with nice detail, and the usual oak leaf detail on the pea guard, and also on the back strap. Uh, this was a relatively cheap sword. Uh, to purchase, so we see <coughs> we see a, quite a few of them. And then we go to the Sharn Horse design, which again we're going to see the same money saving effect. The Sharn Horse is a panther head. 
But notice that the um, langette, the cross guard, and the P guards are the same. So Icorn only had to have the uh, back strap fitting uh, with the panther head in order to um, make this a lion head. Incidentally, this uh, Von Stein is an aluminum piece, gilded, and this um, um, short horse, yeah, uh, is a very heavy um, brass example. Now we're going to go from the uh, uh, short horse uh, to a, probably the most popular of the field marshal swords, uh, the Prince Eugen. And uh, it's spelled E U G E N. So don't say Prince Eugene. If you say that, everybody will think, ah, oh, this guy, you just say that. In German, EU is pronounced OI, so it's Prince Eugen. So we'll show you what the Prince Eugen sword looks like. Um, these were a very, very popular design uh, that was not produced till about 1939. It was one of the last. Uh, patterns that um, Icorn introduced in the Field Marshal series, and it has a wonderful open eagle on the cross guard. Uh, but you even get two for your money because there's a Wehrmacht eagle on the pommel also. Uh, and they they tried to simplify the design of the sword more in an Art Deco range in that the the back plate is um, smooth, and they have two big oak leaves on the grip tabs. See how nice they are? And then on the furrow, they repeat the large uh, grip tabs. And then when we look at the um, D guard, you can see the same thing with two large um, uh, oak leaves. And it has a standard uh, black celluloid grip over wood. Usually they're uh, triple wrapped um, brass with a twisted center. Um, it's a very beautiful design and um, as most of you collectors know there was a Prince Eugen uh, Panzer division in the German army uh, and since the Eichhorn sword was named after Prince Eugen, by the way Prince Eugen was a big hero uh, in the old days of um, Austria. Uh, Vienna at that time was having a lot of trouble with uh, Turkey and those areas and uh, Prince Eugen was able to get rid of uh, those people and free the country. So he was um, quite a hero and um, still is today. There's a huge uh, statue of Prince Eugen in the uh, Herald Square in Vienna and you'll see uh, when uh, Austria was annexed in um, 1938, you'll see uh, hundreds if not thousands of soldiers standing around this humongous Prince Eugen uh, statue. So he was, a, he was a very popular fellow and um, became very, very rich also during his time. But the Prince Eugen sword because it was named after, or not named after, the, the Prince Eugen division was uh, Panzer Division. Uh, because of the name, uh, a lot of um, SS officers who did not qualify for an SS officer sword um, did buy these designs to wear with their uniforms. And sometimes you'll see them uh, they'll look like they're silver, but actually the Prince Eugen sword is a pot metal underneath of the uh, gilding, and the pot metal uh, often came off very easily. Uh, this sword is in remarkable condition um, <clears throat> with all of the gilt, uh, but once the pot metal came off, then collectors or whatever over the years maybe rubbed the rest of it off too to make it look silver uh, as though it's an SS sword. Uh, you really don't have to do that because um, the Prince Eugen division wore the um, Prince Eugen swords probably the way they were issued with the gilded finish. 
Uh, I've only seen one that I really believed was um, silver finished. But these are great swords, and again, they have the, um, the wonderful um, nickel-plated blade and uh, just a, a really, really terrific look. So most of the field marshal swords are fairly cheap, but if you get into a Prince Eugen, um, it's according to the condition, but um, they start to get a little pricey in the area of uh, twelve to fifteen hundred dollars, but um, but well worth it. I want to show you another Prince Eugen sword. Um, this piece is um, is very interesting. It has the original porta pea on it, um, and of course the, the nice design. But what's interesting about it is that it has a um, a triple etched blade. Now remember, if you had the bucks or the rice marks, um, you could order an etched blade with your sword. And I once knew a collector from San Francisco. Uh, that collected field marshal swords, but only if they had etched blades. And he actually had a complete collection of uh, field marshal swords with etched blades. I mean, it was wonderful. Uh, I don't know whatever happened to the guy. I haven't heard from him for years, and I assume the, the collection was sold off. But if you want to do the ultimate with field marshal swords, find them with etched blades. And um, I just want to say too that these are not expensive. Uh, you can buy most of these field marshal swords in the uh, five, six, seven, eight hundred dollar range. And if you get the whole set, then you can start to upgrade what you have. If your shorn horse is a little shabby or your Bomb Stein, maybe some of the aluminum is showing through the gilt. Fine, you have the example, but start looking for one in better condition. And before you know it, it may take a few years, but you could have a, a super, super collection. I have a good friend named Brian Rich that uh, decided to collect field marshal swords many years ago, and um, he had a wonderful collection. And he had them all mounted on a round board, all nine of them around the circle, all out of the scabbards with the scabbards next to them. And uh, he would bring that to shows, and it was a wonderful display. And something that you can do, not cheap, but relatively inexpensive compared to, say, what some of the daggers cost. So uh, I'll show you the last sword in the Field Marshal series, and, uh, and this is the one, I apologize to all you guys, but uh, this is the sword that's going to cost you money. Uh, this, is, this is the Lutzow, L-U with an umlaut, Z-O-W. Um, it's a very beautiful sword. Uh, it features a um, Hockenkreutz, uh, with the sword going through it on the langet, uh, but then you get an extra Hockenkreutz for your money because there's a Wehrmacht eagle on the pommel. But again, remember I told you that Eichhorn was saving money with these. When you compare the Lutzow sword uh, to the Prince Eugen sword, uh, you'll notice the Prince Eugen, of course, has a different cross guard. Uh, but look at the pommels on both of them. They've got the same eagles. So again, it was a matter of uh, kind of using the same backstrap. Companies are companies, and you have to figure out ways to save money and still have a lot of appeal to your customers. So the Lutzow, that'll always be your prize in the field marshal collecting series. Um, unfortunately, it was um, the last sword that Icorn made 
before the war started and very, very few of them were produced and that's why they're so rare. And you'll find them both in brass and aluminum base metal. Uh, but they're extremely worthwhile. Uh, they have the, the great uh, nickel-plated blades. Um, they're the prize of your collection. So you start collecting these things and you never know. You might run into a Lutzow and that'll even make you happier. And once you get that, the rest of them are kind of easy. So it's a, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, so on that, we'll end the Field Marshal series. And I hope that this lecture will get people interested in maybe collecting these swords because they're around. I have hundreds of them, I think, on my website. Um, get into them. Start out with that five, six hundred dollar purchase and go from there and as you learn more about it and start to appreciate the designs, I mean it's a lot better than stamp collecting, I'll tell you. It's fun. It's really fun. Just remember try to try to keep them hidden from the wife though, that's the problem. Okay collectors, now we're going to um, uh, talk about uh, SS swords and her Dagon. Swords and Dagon, and uh, Police Dagon. The, um, I guess the ultimate acquisition for any collector uh, is a uh, SS Officer Dagon. Uh, they're always in demand, highly saleable, uh, and a great uh, piece to be able to display in your collection, maybe with a dagger or an SS uh, peak cap or something. Uh, they, uh, the design uh, was originally produced uh, by Professor Diebich, who was in charge of um, anything that could be properly worn uh, by the SS. And um, you know the little stamps that you see on the bottom of the hilts and the uh, top of the scabbards with the SS runes entwined together. You also see the same um, logo on Alec Porcelain. Diebich was um, a member of the Alec firm. And again, these were items that were deemed to be worthy of use by the SS. So we'll see those um, little stampings, which was really Diebich's mark. Uh, we call it the SS Kulter Zeichen. K-U-L-T-U-R-Z-E-I-C-H-E-N. So Diebich was a very important man uh, to Himmler, and uh, he was uh, also part of um, Himmler's uh, group of um, knights in the Velvisberg um, Castle, a very important man in the SS. So he designed not only the SS Dagen, uh, but he um, also designed the um, Chained SS, another dagger that you'll see his mark on the back of the chains. But first we'll talk about uh, the 1936 model SS Dagen. Um, it's a very simple design uh, but yet very elegant in its simplicity. Uh, the Degans, the early ones, uh, the hilt was made of solid nickel. Uh, on the later produced ones, uh, they were nickel plated. But of course, the nice part about solid nickel is there's never any pitting or any problems. Uh, they show very little age other than the dull patina that nickel gets. Um, the top of the sword had a pommel that was plain and serrated edges around it. Uh, this, of course, if taken off, exposed the top of the tang below, which had a little cap on it. So don't ever try to disassemble one of these swords because it takes somebody that really knows what they're doing. And in addition to that, on these early swords, there is a fitting here 
it looks like a step up fitting, but it's not. It's a it's actually a nut that unscrews. Uh, the later pieces, uh, this is just part of the casting as a step up fitting and not a separate nut. The grips were all of um, ebony, uh, beautifully done with the ribs and wrapped in um, uh, nickel wire. Uh, they always had a, a beautiful, um, I can't show it too much because the porta piece on here, but we'll have another one I can show you. The ferrule was a series of six oak leaves that were highly hand enhanced and because of the hand enhancing each sword is different from another because it was personally done by the, the jeweler. And then set in the middle of the grip uh, was a matching uh, nickel uh, SS runic symbol uh, with pebbling in the backgrounds of the uh, raised runics uh, with a black uh, color added to it. Um, very beautiful. And then the the portipi that was introduced uh, a little earlier, actually, the portipi came out in 1935, whereas the Degen was 1936. And then the, um, the scabbards were black, uh, and they had an um, upper fitting uh, that consists of a, a series of, um, of line um, um, images uh, with a curl at the bottom, and we call this the Wotan's Knot. It, it was an old Germanic design that appears on German armor from the medieval time. And in between the knot, uh, there were spaces that were pebbled and were um, tarnished black or had black added by the factory. Uh, of course, on an officer's piece, then there was a lower fitting, uh, that was held on, on uh, the no maker type, which this one was, um, was put on, um, pressed on, uh, whereas the, uh, the fitting was put on hot, and then when it cooled, it shrunk and, and it won't come off of the scabbard. And then the, the swords have a, um, uh, a matte finish uh, blade. They're not highly polished. It's a matte finish look with a single fuller, and the early swords all have a white leather knot. Uh, and normally, um, they'll be stamped with the SS Coulter Zeichen. It's underneath the knot, so we can't uh, show that to you. Uh, but you can, I think, see it on the throat of the scabbard. So this is a, um, a textbook, uh, early example, and in about the, um, the best condition that you're going to find. And they were also issued with a, um, a leather um, hanger uh, for normal usage, uh, but for parade and dress wear, they made a, um, a brocade strap uh, with um, Aluminum bullion uh, brocade with a buckle. The backing is leather, and it was connected with a, um, a chain and regain hook. Uh, and we like to see on the on the reverse of these snap clips, there's always a little anchor there on the real ones. That's what you like to see. And one of these um, brocade hangers can. Uh, uh, can cost as much as a Prince Eugen sword, but but they're worthwhile to have with your with your example. Um, this is a uh, this is another early sword. Uh, this particular uh, Dagen uh, was owned by a um, SS Gruppenführer by the name of uh, Hedesheimer, and his uh, monogram is on the pommel. Um, it's really fun when you can find something like that because it gives you the ability to then uh, research the SS officer. And in the case of this example, it really makes it easy because Hedesheimer's um, serial number is stamped into the blade. 
I meant to tell you about the, um, the, the furrows on these two, which I couldn't on the last sword. This one doesn't have a knot on it. But you can see they, they have six standing oak leaves with acorns in the center. And each oak leaf was hand enhanced, and each acorn has little checkering on the caps. So it's really, really nice work. Um, I think you can see, yeah, here we go on, on this sword. You can see the Coulter Zeichen stamping underneath. Remember, that meant that this sword was appropriate for the SS to wear, according to Professor Diebich. And usually you'll find the stamping on the scabbard throat. Yes, there it is on, on this example. So this is what you kind of want to see. It's, this is an unmarked piece. You also see pieces by Peter Dan Krebs. I might point out, too, that um, original SS officer swords, the teardrop on the quillen end has a partial hole drilled in it, just partial. And it's just done uh, for decoration. Uh, but you know, you, when you see reproductions of these swords, very often that a uh, hole is all screwed up. They just drill a little tiny thing in there or something. And if you get used to looking at that, you can tell a fake from uh, uh, across the room. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, another piece uh, that's early. Now, this one's unmarked also. Uh, it's really the same as the, uh, the other two in nice condition. Beautiful runes in the grip, um, all the markings like do you see it, and, and the little drilling of the hole in, in the teardrop there. I also like to look at the, uh, the pommel. Um, the pommel on these examples was usually silver plated. It wasn't nickel like the rest of the swords, so a lot of times those pommels will be black with patination. So that's the, that's the standard early SS Dagon. Uh, and then we also run into uh, Dagons that were produced in um, Dachau, and we'll talk about that. Before we leave the um, early SS Dagons, uh, I just want to add that there's also another knot that once in a while we see. Uh, it's an extremely rare knot and very valuable to collectors. Uh, for years this knot was called an NCO, but of course if, um, if it was an NCO knot we would see them all the time, but we do not. Uh, in my book on the SS uh, I found a photograph uh, of a number of um, uh, Seeker Heitsdienst SD people that were wearing this knot uh, on their dagger swords as well as um, etch bayonets. So I think it was a knot that was just for the Seeker Heitsdienst, uh, but whatever it's for, uh, it's a tremendous um, asset if you can find a knot like that. Um, uh, these knots are really pricey and uh, uh, you wind up paying $1,500 or something for one, but they're, but they're worth it. So from the early and mid-period SS Dagen, then we go to the uh, pieces that were produced at Dachau. Most collectors know that um, uh, Himmler uh, grabbed Paul Mueller, the uh, superb Damas smith in Germany, uh, and made a contract with him where they set up a forge at the uh, SS Dachau, uh, and Himmler was in charge then of making uh, SS swords uh, for use of the SS. And at that point, we see Dagens, SS officer Dagens, produced at Dachau, and they're very easy to tell from the early examples because they're actually made of stainless steel. Uh, whereas the earlier pieces were either solid nickel or nickel plated. And I remember the first time I ever encountered a sword like this, probably back in the late 70s, 
at a show, everybody said, oh, it's a repro. Look at it. It, uh, it doesn't have any fitting on the top of it. The, uh, the furl here is a separate piece. And, and look at how it looks like it's chrome or something. Well, they are original pieces um, made under Paul Mueller's direction. Uh, they have the ebony grip. Uh, the runes button is also of stainless steel, just like the rest of the parts. The only part that is not, it's the, the pommel uh, was made of uh, steel silver plated. Um, so they, um, uh, they were what they were, and uh, they're still a good looking piece. The um, scabbards that come with these pieces are a little thinner than the scabbards that came with the standard pieces. And uh, normally they'll have a, uh, um, a screw that holds them from the, uh, the, the, the edges uh, as opposed to the big dome head screw that was on the regular pieces. Uh, and the lower fitting is, is retained by, by screws. Uh, and they still have the same stainless steel, or not stainless steel, the, the same um, uh, matte finish blade, uh, which may have been stainless steel. I don't think so, though. Uh, sometimes you'll see them marked PMD. Um, most of the time, though, they will be unmarked. And the dock out pieces always have a black washer, not a, uh, a white washer. Uh, these pieces... Uh, because they're not the quality of the early pieces, I guess we could put an early piece next to it so you can, can see the differences a little bit. Uh, see how on the early piece the top furrow is built into the, um, uh, the D-guard where it's a separate piece. See how the uh, runes are shiny like the rest of the piece because they're stainless steel. And they also didn't blacken the uh, backgrounds of the oak leaves on the furrow. And the same is true of the Wotan knot configuration. You'll notice that that's not blackened. Uh, also an interesting aspect is that if you look at the quill and end, they don't have the little partial drilling in that the earlier swords have. So that's what the Dachau pieces uh, look like. And then we'll, uh, we should also talk about the uh, uh, SSNCO Dagen. Uh, the NCO Dagen was introduced um, after the uh, officer one, and uh, probably about 1938. And normally, uh, you'll find the NCO Dagen um, uh, is nickel-plated fittings, not solid nickel. Uh, they have the same beautiful ebony grip, but it's not wire wrapped because it's not for an officer. Uh, they have the same beautiful uh, oak leaves with the hand work all done on, on the lower furrow. Uh, no little drilling in the quillin because it's an NCO. And then the, um, the pommel cap has the SS runes uh, raised out with darkening in the backgrounds. Um, the um, configuration of the upper scabbard fitting is pretty much the same. They did have the blackening between the Wotan's knot. Uh, this one is fairly worn, uh, but it's, um, it was there originally. Uh, and the matte finish blade, the same. I don't know whether this one's marked or not. Uh, yeah, it is. This is the uh, Peter Dan Krebs, which also made uh, many of the officers Dagen. Uh, and the Krebs pieces will always be equipped with the uh, white washer. And since it's an NCO, uh, the bottom of the scabbard, the chape area, is built in. Uh, it's not a separate fitting. Uh, the knot that's on this is uh, an NCO SS knot. That's what should be on a piece like this. Not, not this knot. But if you get this knot on it, it's worth more than the sword, probably. So there you, there you have that. So before I leave the, um, 
traditional SS section, uh, you might ask, uh, oh, I didn't see any um, SS candidate swords in your uh, uh, presentation here. Um, that's just because I just don't happen to have one currently, but I just want to talk about them for a little bit. Um, it's my opinion that there is no such thing per se as an SS candidate Degen. Um, you have to remember if you have a Dean Stalter's list, uh, which consists of hundreds and hundreds of names of SS officers, and if you look on each name, it will say whether the officer had the Degen or not. And you think, well, didn't all SS officers have Degens? The answer is no. If you look down the Dean Stalter list, maybe 40% of them did. In order to get the SS officer Degen, you had to be a graduate of one of the SS schools, like Bad Tolts, where you received your Degen on graduation. You had to be a member of Himmler's office, part of the staff. You had to be a leader of a regimental group. Um, or you had to be uh, over the rank of, um, uh, not group and fewer, uh, what's the colonel rank below it? It slips my mind now, but uh, um, anyone else did not get an Officer Dagan. So, a lot of these, what we call candidate swords, they were swords that were made for officers that really wanted to look like, I mean, they wanted to wear a sword too, the same as the other SS guys, um, but according to the rules, they weren't entitled. So the candidate swords, have no SS runes on them anywhere other than maybe the Coulter Zeichen stamping, but nothing in the handle and nothing in the pommel because these guys were technically not entitled to wear the SS Degen. Understand that? So what they did, like all of us, ah, okay. Um, and uh, before the SS Degen was issued, as well as afterwards, um, some officers wanted to buy a sword that they could wear. And in keeping with the silver uh, uh, color of the accoutrements on the SS uniform, um, many of them uh, privately purchased a sword. Um, and we showed you this uh, Icorn Bluger piece before. Uh, but this is one of the swords that uh, an SS officer, uh, probably prior to the uh, institution in 1936 of the Dagen, uh, bought this so that he could wear it with his uniform. Uh, it's all silver plated and he wore it with the uh, SS Dagen. Uh, and it's interesting, the, uh, the sword is... Um, uh, has the Coulter Zeichen stamping uh, underneath of it, and other than that, it's it's a standard um, uh, Blucher Army sword, except it's silver plated. It is a brass model, uh, but very very um, interesting for a collection and a, and a great addition. Uh, other examples: uh, this particular piece is a um, uh, a Panther head. Uh, in silver, made by um, Alcozo. Very beautiful. It's got the red eyes. Sometimes you'll see green eyes, although when I see that with silver swords, sometimes I think they're customs, but uh, this is indeed an SS sword with the standard Alcozo eagle, uh, beautiful panther head, uh, nice uh, uh, oak leaves on the back strap as well as the uh, D-guard. Uh, and then on the reverse of this sword, there's a really nice touch, which really appeals to collectors. Uh, there's SS insignia uh, built into the uh, seal on the back. 
And the knot is also a early black version, which we associate with um, SS early swords. And the insert is kind of interesting. I never saw that one before. Uh, but this is a, a very nice um, early SS sword. And I'll show you another one. Uh, some officers uh, either couldn't get or didn't want to pay for the silver finish and instead uh, bought a, um, a gilded uh, finish. This particular sword is, is um, a gilded aluminum example uh, with an officer's knot on it. Um, and in addition, on the reverse, we have SS runes built into the Langette. Um, but also what makes this sword quite interesting to collectors is the fact that uh, on the reverse, I hope I have it the right side up, uh, it comes from uh, Das Reich, is it? I can't see it that well, but uh, it's a uh, very interesting um, etch blade. A very valuable uh, sword that the original owner just didn't qualify for a, an officer's sword, so he, he bought his own. Very, very nice item here. We're going to talk a little bit about um, police tagging now. Um, I know it's kind of been a long video, but I hope you can still hang in here for, uh, for the last part. Um, the police tagging wasn't introduced until uh, 1938, and uh, there weren't the restrictions that I mentioned about the SS tagging so that uh, anyone that was a qualified uh, police officer was entitled to receive the Dagon. And in some cases where um, a policeman was also an SS member, uh, you'll find um, Dagon with um, uh, an SS uh, style uh, pommel on the top of their police piece. Uh, I don't happen to have one of those to show you, but at least I'll, I'll mention it. But the um, Mm, that's good. But the, the basic police tagging uh, is very similar uh, to the SS officer. This is an officer example. Uh, the main difference being, of course, that the, um, uh, the grip has the insertion of a police eagle. Um, and you will see um, eagles, some of copper, and um, some of aluminum. This is a copper example. The um, NCO examples usually have aluminum, uh, but you also see aluminum ones on officers. Uh, the pommel is, um, is plain. Uh, the fittings will be plated normally, nickel plated. They have the same nice uh, work to the uh, furrow, uh, and you can, uh, when you get used to looking at these things, uh, you can tell that this is an Alcozo piece from across the room because Alcozo, for some reason, uh, always silver plated their Wotan knot upper scabbard fitting as well as the lower furl. And they also used a real big screw at the bottom loop. Uh, only Alcozo did that for some reason. Um, guess I better show you. Yeah, it really is an Alcozo. See that uh, trademark on the blade? So that's what, um, that's what you want to see with Alcozo Degen. The wire wrap is the same as the SS. The cover uh, plate on the back is the same. Uh, and they're really a, um, a nice collectible. And since, uh, let's face it, um, Nazi Germany was a police state uh, so we see a lot of these uh, Dagen. Uh, this is the um, uh, uh, police NCO version. Uh, the main difference between the two is the pommel cap. See how the NCO piece, the pommel cap, is flat, whereas the officer piece, it's the uh, rounded type with the serrated edges. Uh, 
And police pieces normally have an aluminum uh, eagle that's not raised as much as the officer piece. Um, this example is by Holler, I believe. Yeah, see the, the thermometer there? And it's in nice condition. Um, Holler, for some reason, did not put the darkening between the Wotan knot. Um, Holler pieces are not SS uh, stamped with the Coulter Zeichen either. Uh, in fact, um, uh, the only police pieces you really see that are stamped with that Coulter Zeichen, um, Icorn did it, um, uh, Peter Dan Krebs, and uh, some others, but uh, that stamping, as time went on, uh, was not so uh, important to manufacturers, so you don't see it that much. Another example that's, um, that's worth looking at, uh, this is a um, police officer Degen. Uh, this one has a, um, a copper eagle. And what's interesting, too, is that the ebony grip, if you look closely, is wrapped with copper wire also. Uh, you don't see this very much, but you do every once in a while. And it's nice to know that it does exist. Otherwise, you think, ah, oh, somebody changed that wire. Well, they, they didn't. Uh, this particular example is made by um, Herman Rath. And the Rath pieces are interesting because they are stamped with a diamond on the Ricasso reverse along with their name and uh, Soligan. Uh, Herman Rath had a very good relationship um, with the SS and the police. And um, you'll see, if you look at period magazines, you'll see their uh, ad a lot for uh, the product. Uh, they were a very good producer and uh, actually made a few SS officer Degens too, which you very rarely see. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, an overview. I know I've talked a lot about it, but uh, uh, I really just kind of touched the surface. Uh, you, you have to uh, thoroughly study the... Uh, uh, the subject because um, there's a million people that are out there trying to trick you with these Degens. They, they buy a, uh, a $300 police Degen and uh, uh, take the police eagle out of the grip and then fill it in a little bit where the wings spread out and try to make it round and, and put an SS uh, rune symbol in there. I, I I don't know why that is. I, I guess people are just greedy, but uh, but you have to look out for that. Um, just like anything in this hobby, uh, I guess where there's money involved, it, it always attracts the dishonest. But I don't want people to get um, creepy about it, because most things are original. A lot of collectors, they when they're new, at least, they say, oh, I'm not sure this is real. And they're, they're always looking for uh, bits and pieces that, oh, this doesn't look right to me. That, just remember, these things were looked at to be held at at arm's length. And if you start looking at uh, runes buttons and police eagles and through a loop and all this stuff, um, it's not going to look good. I mean, it's like... If you, I've said this before, if you look at my nose through a loop, well, it doesn't look very good anyhow, it's always red. <laughs> but uh, uh, your nose isn't look, meant to be looked at through a loop, and e either are these um, parts and pieces. So you have to give a little bit of uh, leverage for that kind of stuff. But if you get look, used to looking at several examples, you'll see that they may have the same things that you thought bothered you to begin with. So it's all, it's a matter of experience. Um, collecting these things is a, um, a tremendous 
experience. I mean, it's it'll run your life. It's so much fun, and especially if you study the history, it, it is uh, uh, extremely rewarding. And if you can get some friends that also collect that you can call once in a while or talk on the email, uh, it's just it's a ball. It's it's a a tremendous asset to your life. Uh, I hope that once all this stuff is over, uh, that the shows will get going again. And I look forward to, to seeing so many new people. Um, we've gotten a lot of uh, uh, additional emails and business and interest from our seminars. And uh, we'll continue to do them. And I hope you liked this one. It was kind of long, I guess maybe a little bit complicated here and there. But if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email. Uh, I'm always glad to help where I can. So have a good one, guys.